House music is not just for listening to, it's a movement for freedom and a way of bringing together cultures from all walks of life. It was a time to challenge convention by casting out the old and bringing in the new. People were ignoring the social norms and using music as a way to rebel against it. The essence of house music was born from disco in the 1970s from the godfather of house, Frankie Knuckles, and the telepathic master of the party, Larry Levan, through Chicago's warehouse and New York's Paradise Garage. Going back to the 80s, you've got these DJs, they're literally making the music, and then the next day, playing it in the club. And there's something very sort of grassroots about that. Before Warehouse opened, there had been many clubs designed to segregate race. However, the warehouse did not make any difference between blacks, Hispanics or whites. The main interest was simply music. Black, white, Asian, straight, gay, doesn't matter because you're like-minded in that one room, sweaty, deaf a little bit and chilly. Music brought together a community of people and symbolised their escapism together from harsh realities. So we talk about the state of Chicago as a city, but obviously at this time, being a gay person in that part of the world wasn't particularly great either. Did it, and um, because it was from that subculture again, which they uh, never really accepted into their um, their mainstream, whether it be in music or politics or sort of a class or anything like that. Frankie Knuckles was obviously a legend. He started experimenting with electronic drums. He started making these tracks. Um, one thing I saw in an interview that he said, um, he'd made this track and he thought it was really great and he just didn't have any vocals for it and he didn't know where to go to get vocals. He didn't know how to record them at the time, he didn't have the facilities to do it. And what he found was uh, a recording of a gospel band, um, so it's a cappella, no song. combine that with one of the tracks that he's made and you can see when you listen to that track that it's one of the, it's almost like the for, one of the forerunners for sort of modern funky soulful house you can really feel that in that track uh, Frankie Knuckles and Derek May they used to play like 12 hour sets or even sometimes more than that and that you, in that time you can really travel through your music taste and really display what you're about. House music displayed several characteristics similar to disco music which preceded and influenced it as both were DJ and record producer created dance music House was more electronic and minimalistic, with 4-4 beats and synthesised bass lines. Chicago also brought about DJ Pierre. Him and his friends accidentally created Acid House using the Roland 303 bass line machine, when they were messing around with drum beats and the squelchy noise was born. From this, they later produced a track called Acid Tracks, and this became the catalyst for the Acid House sound. Acid House was kind of an explosion of songs emanating from yeah from DJ from DJ Pierre in the 80s who was using the, the 303 quite a lot manipulating the sounds on there like the frequency and the resonance on tracks to give it to that that squelchy sound. I don't think there's any denying that like Acid House was was enhanced by drugs, um, but. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of early stuff like yeah, starting in the eighties um, was made with with that squelchy type bass line, um, and that really suited the music style at the time, which was developing into like what what house is today. America were making the music, and the UK were playing it, because house was all about bringing people together from different walks of life. Pirate radio stations allowed it to be shared across Europe. Pirate radio stations have always been essential in spreading any, like, many uh, music genres and it obviously shows the, the darker side of the genre and other sides of the genre that maybe is not so in popular culture. So I think it's very crucial that pirate radios, for, for all genres, but yeah, for house especially, like, 
spreading it out to Europe when it was originated in America and stuff. Pipe radio stations became suddenly so important that people were sending their promos to DJs knowing they'll get played on the pipe radio. Because if you get played there, you get more airtime. And there you get, because in those days there was no websites and, and that, you know, you had to publicize yourself. And I think getting other people to play your tunes that you were making, the pirate stations made it big before they got captured and then hit the, the main scene. While in Ibiza, due to its genuine isolation since the Spanish Civil War, it became a haven for people to be free. These clubs, fueled by their distinctive sound and copious consumption of the club drug, ecstasy, began to influence the British scene. In Ibiza, in the early 90s, it was all about Balearic music. You'd be playing, you'd be playing, I don't know, a Happy Monday song, U2, Candy Staten, uh, the FBI project all mixed together because that was, it was bringing together like-minded people. Well, it was, uh, you know, the house scene was really the 70s, she was 54, disco, big, uh, everyone went down there, who's who went there. Uh, even the, some of the guys from, from the UK went over to America, witnessed and saw what was happening with that scene and then brought it back. We had Shroom, you know, right down in, in London, uh, Healy, Ramping, all the gang. Then up, up north you had Manchester, uh, you had all the beginnings there with like Mike Pickering, Graham Park, you know, like, there's a myriad of people that are, that are still around now, that are still stars because of that background. By late 1987, DJs such as Danny Rampling, Nicky Holloway, Paul Oakenfold and Johnny Walker were bringing the Ibiza sound to key clubs. These were known as the Ibiza Four. The birth of the um, synthesizers, drum machines and everything else, um, sequences and sequences of music, um, which really did start to bring it to the, the part of the early 90s when the rave culture really started to um, hit big, um, especially in the um, UK where I would really say um, rave was really sort of unique to that. The Ibiza 4, as, as they're called, uh, are only sort of stuff we heard about in Legends at the minute because we're all quite quite young than my circle of friends but um, those of them that are old enough to remember uh, going out back in the day when it was Danny Rampling and Paul Oakenfold um, certainly talk about them in High Stew and um, say that they are some of the, the pioneers of dance music in the UK and certainly bringing back that into the UK from Ibiza was probably a, a big moment. The birth of techno and hard house brought an intellectual feel to house music and raves started. It was really, really massive in the UK. You know, it didn't really get too far outside the UK except for one, it went to Australia, a bit of, in America. But um, the decision was just that I was, that was the music I was listening to at the time. I'd be going to Birmingham to um, Wobble, Money Bennies, going out and partying, and then the After Hours Club was uh, the hard house, which is what I used to do for like two years every Sunday morning. I'd be there knocking on the door waiting to get in at seven in the morning um, to pretty much listen to just like that, the hard house. I didn't play at them in the 90s because I really kind of started in 97. It was kind of more in clubs and things, but I actually did go to them. I did, I did go to the illegal warehouses. Um, I'd go to a party in Birmingham and then you'd go to the phone box because we didn't have mobile phones then. How crazy is that? I don't think so. And, um, and, and then some, somebody would call up the phone box and say, right, meet you here with an address. And, um, and then you used to go on for that. And, the, and you know, it was, it was an amazing time. It sort of really goes back to uh, um, I would say like the 60s and the 70s, you know, the, um, the psychedelic era, you know, um, it was all about people coming together, having a good time, and obviously everyone knows about the, uh, the illicit side to that sort of um, era as well, and that's really sort of grown all the way through. People had sound systems, um, Derbyshire, where, I'm, um, where I originate from, um, where I reside now, um, probably one of the largest ones of the time was uh, Smokescreen, which are, which are still going and still do some, some free parties um, on that sort of need-to-know basis. I think the uh, worst experience I ever had um, with regards to um, police when going to um, a, a, a rave, it was an all-night party in Bradford. Um, I can remember it well because it was a um, it was an old leisure centre, so the main area was like a, a swimming pool. But what I can remember, um, what really stood out to me, was when the music stopped, and um, obviously everyone was curious at that point, and. Um, everyone's attention was drawn to the stage where police actually came onto the stage and announced that the event had to stop because somebody uh, died from taking an overdose of um, an overdose of um, ecstasy. 
This fueled a moral panic in the media and they used ecstasy as the culprit. I think media put raves in a bad light. I mean, they stopped the one of the main ones in Wales, which was when they did brought on the law in about the repetitive beats or basically stopping everybody partying in the field because they didn't know how to secure it, to secure, secure the people. Um, they didn't know what they were taking um, and they basically couldn't get a hold on it. They didn't know anything about it. So, um, so then just stopped it all. The Criminal Justice Bill was created in 1994, shutting down all illegal raves with the ban of repetitive beats. From this, a new generation of clubs were born, super clubs. It, it was it was a, a whole new jump. You felt safe. Um, I'd be more careful if you're in a drug culture. But there again, feeling safe, sure that's better than than not knowing what's gonna happen to you. Because if you know if you go to certain places and you're feeling nervous, you can be, you know, a target. So I think the super glove that the stuff that happened, I think it was needed. And the drug culture continued, but in a spit in a in a more secretive, less open way. They were created with a 24-hour licence and they were more about the music than the drinking. When you play late night sets and it's dark and you play like quite serious stuff, the crowd are really into it, but it's more just like marching and they're kind of in a trance, whereas when you're playing like feel-good songs, classics that they know, like happy tunes, proper house music from back in the day, like people, when they know the lyrics as well, they love it, they'll sing along, they'll definitely dance with it. The euphoria at a club gave a sense of belonging. It felt like you were part of a family, and this would stop all wars. All culture colliding made a scene without rules, the product of enterprise culture, no matter what the qualifications. It was an inclusive movement about love, tolerance and freedom. Seeing people having a good time, that's another, another, another buzz. And you connect with people in that kind of way. If you've got something you're saying and they understand that, then that's another way of just encompassing people because music is about people. There was some backlash with this when equipment got stolen and things started to go wrong when people tried to make money from clubs due to drugs being sold. And the example of Leah Betts, which caused a huge media surge, using her image to push the war on drugs. Certain venues probably have more of a tough time. I would I'd probably say like the um, the big organised events, probably like the festivals, like things like We Are or um, others similar to that. Um, they they don't have that sort of um, problem that a lot of the clubs will have. Um, sort of connected to that, like the um, the Rainbow um, complexes in Birmingham. Um, they recently lost their licence um, due to somebody having a, um, a, a having a death row taken ecstasy again. This meant tighter security measures on clubs, and the idea of house music was being crushed as people were losing their freedom. I do suppose it's like, um, it's horses for courses, isn't it? I mean, back in the day, it was like, it was very big into drugs and things like that, you know, like, what, um, you know, Woodstock and things like that. Um, but now it's a different matter as well. And there's so many kind of um, policies and stop barriers to making us have fun these days. You know, they took away the, the uh, free party and I used to go to the DIY parties that dig some worse and stuff in Nottingham and Derby and a uh, rave on a bale of hay for... Uh, days um, <laughs> warming myself on a caravan do you know what I mean that kind of thing so um yeah I do feel it's been uh, smashed down you know all the um well just too many too many restrictions really so uh, we need to change that clubs over the past few years have been getting closed down since 2005 the club scene has slowly been depleting to be honest there's so many incredible amazing like um producers engineers DJs now the only thing that I worry about is that there's not enough venues to, to, to for them to be able to do what they've got to do. Uh, I think this is a lot to do with like drug use in the venues and underage people going to raves. Um, but it's such a shame. Fabric in London as well got shut down and then reopened, but now it's a lot stricter. Um, I feel like it's a, a really big problem it needs to change because the scene's not going to develop if clubs keep closing and people can't express themselves. But people fought back and luckily managed to get Fabric reopened after two months. In today's society, the issue being raised is that of equality. The amount of interest with wanting more female DJs to become more prominent in the house scene is increasing. It is a male-dominated thing. There is like what's less than 5% of people doing festivals and things are ladies. So, um, yeah, basically that means let's get some more ladies involved and do that. And men, whatever, everyone.
everyone. <laughs> Just because you know you're a different, um, you know, you're different sex, it doesn't mean that you know you, you you can't gain that talent. If you have that star quality, it doesn't matter what race you are or what you have between your legs, you're gonna you're gonna rise to the top. So. You can think about it all day and get annoyed and think, oh, this is so unfair, or you can just get on with it because life isn't fair. And that's just the way it is. Nina Kravitz, of course, uh, who's one of the biggest techno DJs in the world. Uh, Leicester's biggest DJ is Lisa Lashes, for example, female. Um, so I, I guess, um, yeah, if you're good, you're good. But I think, as well, if you're a female, I think, I, I think it is easier, a lot easier nowadays. Considering the original creators of House, Frankie and Larry were both black and gay. The scene has changed a lot since then, but for what reason? Trying to get like more people, more DJs, because they have more friendship circles and trying to just do it for like a business perspective, when that's not the point of the night really. That's not the point of any night. Being at a rave, dancing in the crowd and feeling the vibes from the music is something not to be missed. We need to keep this scene going and support not only the DJs from different cultures and backgrounds, but the venues that hold these talented individuals. And house music generally plays on that emotion of um, uh, togetherness as one. And give it to you on, on a tune, and that becomes what your life is. That vibe, or that groove, that moment, or just that little snippet of time, then surely th there's nothing else better. House is the past, the present, and it needs to be the future. Just